Hey, welcome. We've been talking through the calculus needed for AP Physics C classes, and we've gotten to a point where we can address some problems. So we're going to actually do parts of FRQs, actual FRQs, from previous test questions. And this is all based on this series. I'm doing a series here of five key lessons of things you need to know about dealing with calculus in AP Physics classes. So let's go ahead and get to it. There is a lot of information on the screen, so let's just take it bit by bit so you don't get overwhelmed. Let's start with the white graphic on the left-hand side that I just showed an arrow with. So this is actually a huge, huge idea in AP Physics. The concept is that there's this fundamental relationship between position, velocity, and acceleration. But before we continue, I do want to define what I mean by these things. Position is just essentially a point on an axis. So like an X value, a Y value, a combination of an X and Y. You can even think of this in three dimensions as well. We're going to work with one dimension here and just say that's like an X value would be like our position. And if you have a change in position, you could represent that with an X final minus X initial or the way the College Board would say it would be just X minus X naught. That's pronounced X naught. This set of concepts, the difference in our position from a final point minus an initial point, that's called displacements. Now displacements not in my graphic that I've created above and that's okay. We're just talking about some basic ideas here so you understand what's going on. We could say our definition or basic definition for average velocity would be essentially our displacement, delta x over delta t. Now it turns out that that is, another way of writing that would be dx over dt, which is in the format of a derivative, right? So if you take a look at this, it makes sense to say that if we take the derivative of position with respect to time, the change in x divided by the change in t, then you would get the velocity. And in fact, if you did that, then this would turn into just v. It's no longer average because if this dt is a limit as you approach zero, then basically that v average becomes just a v value, a v at a certain point in time as the delta t gets smaller and smaller, as we use with derivatives. All right, and then another concept we need to talk about similarly is going to be an average acceleration idea. So average acceleration is just delta v over delta t, or we could say dv over dt in terms of our derivatives. It's basically the same thing. So if you take the derivative of a velocity with respect to time function, you end up with the acceleration. And in that case, if you're doing the derivative, you can get rid of the average notation because, again, that dt is infinitesimally small. And so it becomes more of an instantaneous acceleration at that point. So that's describing this graphic as you go down the graphic the way I've got it set up. This is crucial. This is really, really important. Similarly, if we do the inverse operations, then it would make sense to say if you take the integral of an acceleration function with respect to time, you end up with a change in velocity. And if you take the integral of a velocity function with respect to time, you end up with a change in position. So if you know this, you can actually do a lot of physics even though at this stage of the year we may not have gone through kinematics, we may not have done a lot of physics at this stage of the year because I'm doing this right at the beginning of the year, you can still now do physics if you just know these fundamental ideas and how to use them. All right, next up I do want to talk about this graph over here. It's produced by this site called OPhysics, which is just a fantastic physics website that you should check out, and I'll put a link to in the description of this screencast. But I do want you to think about what these three graphs, they're all related, are showing, and start thinking about what this object is doing. All right, so if I label this as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we don't know if these are seconds, or we could give them some other name like a tick or something. We just don't know, and that's okay because this is a conceptual situation. So we're going to say if you compare the values for these things from one to the next, then you can see that they make sense. So what do I mean? Well, check this out. At this point right here, point one, I want to think about what the slope is. So I'm going to try to draw it. And then at point two, think about what the slope is here, because that's, that's what a derivative graphically means. It essentially means the slope. Now notice the slope is changing with every tick. So at tick zero, you could say, or at second zero, whatever we want to call it, 
it's going to have zero slope. Well, that corresponds to a zero velocity right here. And every second after that, its velocity gets more and more negative. That slope gets more and more negative. And that's what we see plotted over here as well. In fact, it's changing at a constant rate. And if you look over here, this object has a constant negative acceleration. And one way to think about that is its velocity is changing. The slope of the velocity versus time graph is a straight line in the negative direction. That slope is equal to the negative y value on the acceleration versus time graph. One of the things I want to ask is I want you to think about what do these three graphs represent? What is actually happening in the real world that would give us these three graphs right here? Well, hopefully you can understand that this would be a dropped object, right? So it just drops from rest. Its initial velocity is zero. So our V at time zero or a tick zero is equal to zero. And then every second or every tick after that, it's got an increasingly negative value. All right, and let's take a look at this FRQ right here. This is just part of an FRQ, but it's good to start getting used to format and start thinking about how to approach these kinds of problems. So it says the 100 kilogram box shown above is being pulled along the x-axis by a student. The box slides across a rough surface and its position x varies with time according to the equation given, where x is in meters and t is in seconds. Determine the speed of the box at time equals zero. Okay, so the question is about speed. We have our position. Okay, so speed is like velocity, but it has no inherent direction. It's scalar. So there's more information about that. We'll get into that later in the course. But for now, let's just say let's solve for velocity, and then that will be our answer, basically. So in this case, we can say we can still solve for velocity, and that'll be fine. And what the problem is asking us to do is to go from position to go from position to velocity or speed, so to speak. So how do we do that? Do we take a derivative for that or do we take an integral for that? Well, we're going to do the derivative for this. So let's go ahead and get to it. So we would say, all right, our V equation is equal to dx dt of 0.5t to the third plus 2t. All right, well, V is equal to the end value here is 3, so you multiply 3 times 0 0.5, that'll give us 1.5t to the second plus 2, and that's going to be our equation for the velocity here. Now, looking back at the problem here, it says at time equals 0. All right, well, if we plug in 0, v at 0, therefore, would be 1.5 times 0 squared plus 2, well, that's just going to be 2 and our velocity is going to be in meters per second. Let me talk about units really quickly. When you're doing calculus, like we're doing here, you can kind of ignore units throughout the calculus and then throw in the units at the ends. And the reason for that is it just becomes cumbersome or complex to follow along with units all throughout your problem in physics. In every other case in physics, if you're not using calculus, if you're using algebra, you really should use your units. You need to consistently throw in your units, but when you're doing calc, you don't need to worry about it so much. So for BII, we now know the velocity equation. We need to get to acceleration. So are we going to do that through a derivative or an integral? What do you think? Well, the answer is we're going to do that by deriving a derivative here. So we're going to say, all right, let's use this equation right here that we solve for. And this is very, 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 very common when you're doing AP Physics C FRQ problems. They want you to use past answers for future parts of the problem. So if in A we solve for something, you are probably going to need to use that for a later part of the problem, like B or C or D or something. So in this case, we can say, all right, acceleration is dv dt of 1.5 t squared plus 2. So we could say acceleration is equal to 3 times time. And that's essentially how we would solve this. Now, there's a little more you need to know to solve the rest of BII, but that's going to be good for us right now based on what we're learning. I do want to say that I've covered all of the major material for a regular physics class, and I'm going to be doing more of these lessons for AP Physics C. If you have any comments down below, please let me know, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.